I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Another opportunity to be in the Lord's house. and I can't think of a better place to be than right here with my brothers and sisters, lifting the Lord up, praising Him, thanking Him for all He's done for us. You know, even with the rain, even we've had a lot of rain, we thank the Lord each and every day for everything that, that He's blessed us with. You know, if, uh, if we get to, to thinking, well, everything's too much, then uh, we'll get to, to wonder, why is this dried up on, the, on this side, or why is it too much over here? And if we're not careful, we'll get to complain about it. We need to be thankful, the Bible says, in all things and always. Second Chronicles chapter 7 is where we're going today. Second Chronicles chapter 7, and then we're going to Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures for the text this morning. And then uh, we're going to do, once we get over in here, we're going to do uh, quite a bit of reading this morning because I think it fits perfectly with what I believe the Lord's got in store for us this morning. Second Chronicles chapter 7, but we're not going to go to the verse everybody thinks. Verse 14, we always go to in Second Chronicles chapter 7, which is if my people will, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my, play, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. We're going to go to the first three verses. Second Chronicles chapter 7, first three verses. Now, when Solomon had made an end to, of praying, the fire came down. Everybody say, fire came down. From where? heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house and the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house and when all the children of Israel saw how the say it with me fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth. For how long? Forever. Forever. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be at Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. One scripture. This is John the Baptist speaking. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. Fire. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this morning once again. We lift you up. We praise you. We thank you for everything you've done, Lord. Father, give us your word this morning as it, go, as it goes out. We know that it will not return into you void. Father, give me the words to speak as if it were you speaking it, and let it go forth and minister to hearts and encourage us, uplift us. Give us what we have need of this morning and every day, and we give you praise, glory, honor, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. The title of the message this morning is called A Church on Fire. A Church on Fire. Y'all, before church can be on fire, the members have to be on fire. All of us have to be on fire. We have to have a passion. We have to have a zeal. We have to have a, a desire to do what we do for the body of Christ. Remember this story? Some of you have heard it, but it fits so perfectly. There was a man that uh, had joined the church. Uh, he was very faithful, going strong, had a zeal, had a passion, had a fire burning inside of him. And then all at once, he wasn't showing up for church. Wasn't show Pastor didn't see him. They called a check, no answer. Had made it two or three, four Sundays in a row. Well, the pastor said, finally, I'm just going to have to go see him. He knocks on the door, no answer. He knocks again, no answer. Finally, he said, he heard a voice, said, come on in. Well, it was a kind of a cool winter day. As he opened the door, he looked. He said the lights were off. He said, uh, you see the fireplace going? And he saw the man in a rocking chair sitting in front of the fireplace just rocking. Well, pastor noticed there was another chair right there beside of him. He walks in and sits down. Both of them just sat there. Nothing was said. A few minutes later, the pastor reached over with a little fire poker and Saw the, em, the uh, embers burning there, and there was just a little group of them. The pastor reached over with that little poker, and he just drug one of those little embers of fire off to the side there, away from the other group that was glowing. 
And just do, in a very short span of time, that ember that was off to itself started to go out, started to, started to fade. Just did, we just in a few minutes, it just w went completely out. Pastor took that little ember with that poker and he just scooted it right back over next to the other group of embers that was there burning and glowing. You know what? In just a few short minutes, that one ember that had went out started glowing again. No words were spoken. Pastor stood up, walked around the side, opened the door and was getting ready to walk out. The man said, Pastor, thank you for your message this morning. Amen. Pastor left. See, if we get away from the body, it's so easy to get cool. You want to stay hot? You want to stay on fire? We need to be close. We need to be close with my brothers and sisters. I know what it means to be cold. I've been cold before. I don't like to be cold. Jesus, or Jesus said he was going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire church. If we're really passionate and really excited about who we serve, it's going to show. Amen. There's going to be a fire in us. It's going to be like Jeremiah said, there'll be a fire shut up in our bones. When we get that opportunity to talk about the Lord, we're going to take it. Even more so today, we're going to have to take it. Many of us love that open fireplace. There's something about a fire. There's something that, that you can't, it's about sitting around a fire. You know, pe people rally around fires. You ever, you ever heard of a bonfire? Uh, pe there's something about a fire that cheers people up, that, that lifts people up. You can set people around a fire, and, and you, whether you're sitting there roasting marshmallows or s'mores, whatever everybody likes, to, you can just be sitting around a fire, and you can see the, the, the glow on people's faces, not from the fire, but from the, the, the cheerfulness. Because, you know, what I believe is because our God is a consuming fire. Our God and it talks about it, and I'm going to tell you a few things, a few scriptures about fire and how God understands that we, his people, need to be on fire. You think of the fireplace, the, the, the flickering, the, the light, the crackle of the, of the fire, the smell of the burnt wood. You know, uh, a good. Uh, there's nothing to me like a fire on a cold night. I love that fire. God has always had his fireplaces. He's had the burning bush, the brazen altar of tabernacle, and even on Mount Carmel, when Elijah called down fire, and then his people at Pentecost. The only fireplaces he has today, church, in this world is the hearts of his people that need to be on fire. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit is to burn in the fireplaces of our hearts. When we got our fire going, people know it. When our fire is getting dim, people know it. And when our fire goes out, people know it. There's nothing more pathetic than a drowsy and lethargic cold church. I'm going to say it again. I, only, I, only, I, got a, I got almost an amen. There's nothing more pathetic than a drowsy and lethargic cold church. And you all know what I'm talking about. I'm not calling no names. You're not speak, speaking towards anybody. I'm just saying, when we, get cold, when we get cold, sometimes we think that we're hot. But we're not. What we end up being is lukewarm. And in Revelations, he talks about being a lukewarm church or being a person that's lukewarm. If we're lukewarm, there's not very much you can do with something lukewarm. Nothing. Especially water. I think you can wash in it. It's about the only thing I know that you can do with something lukewarm. Church, what he's telling us is we either be hot or we be cold. Because chances are when you're cold, you know you're cold and you need, some, you need to be hot again. Or you need, if you've never been hot for the Lord, you need to be hot for the Lord. Don't just be lukewarm. When a church loses its favor for Christ, it ceases to be an organism, something lively, and it becomes merely an organization. All we are, if we're not hot, on fire for the Lord, all we're doing is doing a social gathering here. That's all it is. Oh, we're, going, we're, we're another club. A body that is not hot is nothing but a, 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 just a regular club out here meeting once or twice a week. Lacking the spiritual strength to operate as, uh, as a true church of God, it will rely more on uh, the mechanics and machinery. You know, we've got, we've got machinery, we've got technology, we've got instruments, we've got everything that we need to worship the Lord. Everything, if when we show up, we worship the Lord. Now, if we're just going to go through the motions, we, we got a bunch of stuff that looks good. We got, a, we got a bunch of stuff that we can put on the show. 
It's stuff. It's exactly what it is. But when you come in and you put your on fire heart with everything around, it changes everything. It makes us an on fire church. It makes his body an on fire body and it makes people see and want what we have. Hebrews 12 and 29, our God is a consuming fire and he desires to have and will have a church that is on fire with his divine presence and his power. When we're on fire, God shows up. When we're on fire and we got a zeal and we're, we're, we're wanting to show the passion that we have inside of us, God shows up. Even if it's just one of us. We can show up in a crowd. And let me tell you something. People know it when you're on fire. And when you show up in a crowd, people see something and it changes things. It changes <laughs> circumstances. It changes the atmosphere. And you all know what I'm talking about. I don't have to go through that again. Fire consumes it burns out sinful and unnecessary stuff in our life. We want, to be, we want to have pure motives and we want to have pureness of heart. Call down the fire of God. And it will. The fire of God does change us, church. He said we must be on fire for the Lord. It purifies. It makes us clean and holy before God. Fire prepares us. Think about this. Fire prepares us. Think about it as in preparing food. You know, you can eat some types of food. We, we call it raw or uncooked. And some of it's good. But you know what? When you put the fire to it, it makes it set to, a lot of things taste a whole lot better, doesn't it? It prepares. Fire prepares us. It gets us prepared and ready to go for the use of what we're designed and what we were made to do. And as I said before, fire has a cheering effect. When we are caught in, a co in the cold grip of despair and discouragement, he cheers us up onto victory when we got the fire in us. When we're hot for the Lord, when we're just, we're, we, we've got a passion. When, we, when you've got a passion about something, I've talked to people, whether it's UK basketball, whether it's Cincinnati Reds baseball, uh, seems like the, the more you talk to somebody about sport, a sporting event, they get fired up about it. Somebody likes NASCAR and football. Man, you talk to them, you just bring it up. All you have to do is, hey, did you watch a game? Oh, yes, I watched that game. Did you see this? Did you see that going? Man, did you see that car going around? There's a major. I mean, all at once you can see it just, just explode in them. They're just waiting for you to ask them a question about what they are passionate about. When somebody asks you about, the, oh, yes, let me tell you about the Lord. Let me tell you about His goodness. Let me tell you what He's done for me today. Let me tell you how He saved me. That's the type of passion we got to have. Just waiting for somebody to mention something about our spiritual walk or something about, hey, y'all go, go to that church out there that uh, they have a lot of singings going on or they have a lot of preaching going on. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Man, we got something going on. Coming up in July 24th. Church also fires softens. The Holy Spirit softens the heart of sinners and he or she repents. You take an old crusted, old stony heart and you let the fire of the Holy Spirit get in there and it just softens that up and makes that old heart just, so, just soft enough just to where God can really work on you. I've seen hearts that are, that are tough. They're just tough people. Tough to reach. Tough to get a hold of. But you know what? When they see a fire in you and they see a fire in me, that fire spreads. You know what fire spreads? It does. Fire spreads. If I, if I get hot and, and, and I get over here and, and, and brother or sister, we start talking and praising the Lord and, and singing His praises and all at once, that person goes and, and talks to somebody else. And man, before you know it, there's a ring of fire going on. And that's what we want to do. We want to ring a fire all the way around, not only our community, our counties, our state, and our nation. We, church, need a ring of fire in this nation again. I want to see, not just at this church, I want to see every true church of God on fire that when people drive by on this interstate or, or on 801, they see a fire in the sky over, sitting over every church, every true church of, of Jesus Christ. And when they look over there, they say, there's something on fire over there. There's something on fire over there. And when they go over there, they see something on fire, but it's sure not being consumed. They see the fire of the Spirit of God on that church. Was that Brother Shambach? That, in that, uh, he was at a tent revival, wasn't he? It was in Florida. And people thought the tent was on fire. Matter of fact, they even called the fire department, didn't they? They called the fire department. The fire department showed up, 
and said, we've been all over this place and we can't find a fire. And there were several people said they saw the fire, didn't they? They said there was fire on this tent, but it didn't consume it. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't stop the fire now. When, you, when, when fire from God comes, ain't nothing going to stop it. You think about when Elijah called it down from Mount Carmel. He wanted to make sure. Elijah says, I'm going to make sure you know where this fire is coming from and who's bringing the fire. He, and it wasn't him. It was God. Because what he did, he did the little extra that he wasn't even required to do. He said, take them barrels. And he said, fill them trenches up with water. And then think about this. Because this goes totally against nature. The fire licked up the water. We use water to put out fire, but the fire licked up the water. That's our God. In church, fires unite. Just like I said, fire spreads, fires unite. As in uniting different kinds of metal, the Holy Spirit brings unity to the people of God. You take this metal here and you put it beside another metal. There's a space in between them, but you get both of them hot enough, they'll what? Run together, won't they? You get people hot enough, you can't help it but come together and run together. Fire unites us, church. We, when we got the fire of God in our lives, we're going to be united with one another. We're not going to be divided. We're going to be united. And you're going to see it more and more. There's going to be walls coming down from a lot of these churches. There's these denominational walls. They're, they're, going to, they're going to stop saying, I'm the church of this or I'm the church of that. I'm the first or second. I'm uh, Pentecostal. Well, they're going to just say, I'm the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because there is truly going to be a separation. There's going to be a separation. The Bible speaks of it. New Testament speaks of it. Said there's it said there'll be a separation. And he used it like the sheep will be on one side and the goats on the other. And said, when that separation takes place, only the true ones are going to be standing. It's like the wheat and the tear. He said, they're going to grow together for a period of time. He said, well, you know, and he said, let them grow together. Because if you try, if you try to weed them out too early, number, what he's trying to say is if man weeds them out, you're going, you're going to pluck out some of the good stuff. Don't, don't let man do it. He said, let them grow together when, when it's harvest time. And only the Lord of the harvest is the one that can do the reaping and do the gathering. And when the Lord of the harvest does it, see, when he does it and they grow together, he said the, the true and the genuine and the good will always come out and the chaff will always be recognized. And uh, was it, uh, it was, I believe it was Perry, one of them told the story about the wheat farmer. He said there was a wheat farmer out in the Midwest and there was a message being preached about the wheat and the tare. And this lady comes up and says, me and my husband has been a wheat farmer for years. And said, oh, it's so true what you just said about, about how the wheat and the tare grow together. He said, she said, but guess what? She said, there's one distinctive feature of a true, of a true wheat versus a tare. He said, when, you grow, when they're growing together, you can't tell them apart. But when they get to be a certain age, when they get to be a certain maturity level, he said, you, she said, you can definitely tell them apart. It says, because when you can find, come out and you start looking at the true wheat, the true wheat is bent over bowing. The tares stand straight up. He said, isn't that just like some people? The true worshipers will bow and will praise. But a terror will stand there with a prideful look and a haughty spirit and walk around like some of, you, some of the older folks could the high hat you. You ever heard that experience or that expression? You'd be high hat. But true worshipers know how to humble themselves and bow before the Lord. Fire empowers, church. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts. One and eight, and you shall be witness unto me, and into Jerusalem, and to Judea, and all Samaria, and all and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You know what the uttermost parts of the earth? Everywhere on the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth is everywhere on earth. He said we're going to be witnesses when the power of the Holy Ghost is upon us. We're going to be witnesses, not only in our areas, as he was teaching here. We're going to be witnesses everywhere. Everybody will see it on us, see the power of God on us. A church on fire will fast and pray. Oh, I said that word, didn't I? Fast. Mm. Gosh. 
Yeah, I said it fast. But no, church, in all seriousness, a church that's on fire will fast and pray. The members will do it, and we do it corporately. Each, each January 1st, around, around the first day, first few days, we start a corporate fast in this church. A church on fire knows how to fast and pray. You will see, the church will see the need, the pastor, the senior pastor will see the need, the value of the earnest, uh, the value of earnestly seeking God with our whole heart. And that's what you do when you fast and pray. Everything else around you has to be pushed aside and you have to fast and you have to pray. Remember when we talk about fasting and prayer, we, you can't do one without the other if you're going to move God through, through a fast. It goes with fast, it goes with praying. If you're, if you're fasting without praying, all you're doing is dieting. If you're praying without fasting, you're going to the Lord in prayer. But you want to really move the hand of God, you fast and you pray together and be serious seeking God. Amen. Because when you do that, church, rewards come. Scriptures after Scripture back, backs it up if it's done properly. And done properly, according to Matthew 6 and 17 and 18, it says, But thou, when thou fast, anoint thy head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. And what he's saying there, he said, don't do like the Pharisees do, and disfigure their faces and, and walk around uh, like they got old grumpy look on their, oh, I've been fasting, oh, I've been fasting unto the Lord. I've been, you know, making people knowing what you're doing because you know what he said? That's your reward right there. Amen. The only reward you get is when people acknowledge or, or see that you're fasting. But he says, if you do it, wash your face, anoint your head, do as you would do every day where people don't know what you're doing and said that is in secret. But he said, God will reward us openly for doing that. There was examples in the Bible, Moses, when he received the Ten Commandments in Exodus 34, 28, and Elijah received direction from the Lord in 1 Kings 19 and 8, and Hezekiah received his healing for his body while he was fasting. When we are, all, when we are on fire for God, we will respond, God will respond to the needs of our daily prayer and study and meditation life. God responds to us when we humble ourselves when we afflict ourselves, when we do something for the Lord, God's not going to let that go unrecognized. It's not going to happen. God recognizes when we do things for Him. He's got, in Malachi, it talks about a book of remembrance. It says, if you even think upon His name, there's a book of remembrance. Every time you're saying, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, I praise you, Lord. If you're walking around doing that, guess what? There's a book of remembrance. It says, those that thought upon his name. A church on fire will be uncomfortable in this world. Oh, oh. Is anybody besides me uncomfortable right now in this world? Y'all know what I'm talking about? We're uncomfortable in this world. We should never be comfortable in this world because this world has nothing for us. It don't like us. This world don't like us. Listen, Jesus said it plainly. He said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And it was, it's obvious that the world hate, hated Jesus when he was here. So everything of this world's not going to be fun. It's not going to be pleasing if you're true, sold-out, blood-bought child of Christ. This world has nothing for us. we got to be in the world, but we sure don't have to be of it. We don't have to partake of it. And we're going to be that peculiar bunch that, that the Bible talks about. We have to be that peculiar bunch. Because if we're just like everybody else, you know what we're doing? We're fitting in. We can't look like the world. I know I've said it, but I've got to say it again. If people can't see a distinct difference between us and the world, well, why on earth would they want to come to church if the church looks like the world? They don't want to. They won't. They will not come to a place where they can get the same thing outside. They'll come in here when they know that there's a true difference between the, the, the true church of God and the world because they're looking. People are looking. They want something different. They want something genuine. They want something they can hold on to that they know is the real thing. Right. See, Coke's got it wrong. They thought they were the real thing. No, uh, the Lord's the real thing. He's the real thing. And when we 
get that in our hearts and we get that passion and we get that zeal and we get that burning and understand that we are the real thing through Jesus Christ, then we go out there and people see that in us. And they want what we've got. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The fire of God burning in the hearts will burn away our desire for the things of the world. If we're on fire and we're burning, the things of God will actually burn out the things, the desires we have for this world. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things of this world that is enjoyable, and the Lord knows that we do those things, and we enjoy ourselves. We go on vacations, and we do things. Somebody asked me one time, says, if all this is going on and all this is wrong out there, why are we going out there and we, we partaking or doing the, these certain things? You know, there are certain things you can do that the Lord don't mind you doing. You can go camp. You can go to, the, to uh, Florida, to the beach. You can go and, and enjoy these theme parks. You can go do things as long as you're doing them the way God teaches us to do them, not the way the world teaches us to do them. See, the world wants you to incorporate a bunch of other little things in there. So, so it will consume all your time and my time that we won't have time to pray, study, and read. See, that's what happens. The world wants us so caught up into doing so many things that we'll be so consumed and won't have time to do things of God. We won't have time to go witness, or we won't have time to pick up the phone and call and check on somebody that needs to be checked on. We won't have time to in our prayer life. We were praying once or twice a day, morning and evening, and then all at once we're all consumed about doing things that uh, we neglect our prayer life. We neglect our study. We neglect the house of God. See, that's what the world wants us to do. But if we do it in God's way, in God's order, and His priorities, if we do it the way He says to do it, he said, you get, to, you get the blessings of these things. And you know when you go and do things, you can be a witness. You know it? You can be a light. When somebody comes up here and, pray and, and says they want to be prayed over, they're going to take a trip or go on vacation, we pray over them. One of the things that, that uh, I've heard Brother Winston say for years is say, Lord, give them a good time, give them a safe time, and let them be a light and a witness to somebody as they go out. Whether you're stopping at a rest area, a gas station, a restaurant, wherever you're at, if you bow your head and pray, you know what? Somebody will see that. If, you, if you're walking in a rest area and, and you feel the Lord leading you over and talk to somebody, hey, how's it going? We're just traveling, passing through. You know, you can start a little small talk conversation. And before you know it, you end up witnessing to somebody. Things that you don't even think about while you're traveling. You say, well, the Lord used me that way if you're willing to be used. Amen. If you're willing to be used, I don't care who you are, if you're one of His, He will use you. He will use you. 2 Timothy 2 and 4 says, No man that worth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. A church on fire will care for souls. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because he cared for the souls of the people that was in Jerusalem. Psalms 1, 42, 4 says, I looked, this is David speaking, he says, I looked on my right hand and I beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, no man cared for my soul. Listen, if you're looking for people's approval, look again, you're not going to get it. If you want people to approve of you and the things that you're doing, if you're a child of God, they will not approve of you. The world will not do that. Only approval that you need and I need is God's approval. That's the only approval we need. Don't try to please man. You're not going to please man. You're not going to please mankind out here in this world. It's just not going to happen. They, they're doing the old traditional ways, and they won't break tradition even for the Word of God. There was, I believe it was Fred Stone said one time, said this lady... I can't, it may not have been Fred, but said this lady walked up to uh, whoever the preacher was after the service and said, uh, Preacher, said, I know the Word of God says what you said, but I still don't believe it. A church on fire cares for souls. Mark 16, 20 says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them 
and confirming the word with signs following. A church on fire accomplishes great things for the Lord. The power of God is manifest in many ways to His glory. Everything, church, is for His glory. We, the one thing that we should never, ever try to do is take His glory. It all belongs to Him. He won't. You start trying to take it, you're headed for a fall. The power of God is manifest in many ways for His glory. The people get saved. People are getting right with God. They're getting right with each other. And prayers are being answered, church. Families are coming in. People are getting healed. Marriages are being restored. And people are stopped. People, a church on fire that cares for soul, people will stop practicing sin. You know, so I say practicing sin. That's what it means, practicing sin. We might mess up, but that's what it is, a mess up. Now, if you do something intentional, it's one of those uh, worldly sayings, well, I'd rather ask for forgiveness as permission. Well, if you know it to be wrong and you do it anyway for him to know to do good and do it not, to him it's a sin. Okay? There's no backing up. Well, I'll do it and then ask for forgiveness later. Well, you've crossed a line there. You're on dangerous ground when you do that. When you know the truth and you do it not, when, for him to know it, and then you depart from it. It says, you, it's, the Bible plainly says, it's better to have never known the truth than to know it and depart from it. Right. You'd be on dangerous ground doing that. God's serious about this. When the church is on fire, people get on fire and lives get changed. Lives get changed. That's why, that's why salvation is so real. You see it, the evidence, and change lives in people's lives. That's how we know it. Let's turn to the book of Acts. I'm about ready to finish up here, but I'm going This is so important. The book of Acts chapter 2. After the, after the Holy Spirit came and, and the people were filled, there was a great revival took place. Basically, it was the first great revival after Jesus ascended. It says above 3,000 souls came into the church that day. But what we want to do, and I know it's going to be a, quite a bit of reading, but it's so important to do this, I feel. So we're going to read Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 14. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 14. We're, we're probably going to read all the way to the end, of the end of this chapter. But I want you, I'm going to read slow, and I want you to, to meditate on these words because it's important, because this is an example how the church that then was on fire. And we're to follow. We're to follow the disciples leading on this. This, this isn't in, in here just, for, just to tell what happened then. This is to tell what happened then and what's going to happen now. If we are a church on fire. Acts chapter 2 verse 14. Like I said, the Holy, they were in the upper room and said the, 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 Spirit came, the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind. And it says it filled them and it filled the house. And it says that all of them had uh, like cloven uh, tongues of fire up above their head. I'm just giving you a little, of t tell you a little bit beforehand of what, 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 what was going on. And it says they spake in a language, they spake in tongues but they understood in their own language. So you had two gifts of the Spirit going on right here. You had the, the gift of diverse or different tongues, and then you had the interpretation of tongues going on right here. Some people get that confused that there was an unknown tongue. Didn't say an unknown tongue going on right here. There was a gift of diverse or different tongues, one of the gifts. The other gift was there's an interpretation of tongues, and the, the interpretation, everybody understood it in their own language. Then, while this was going, and right as that was going on, people were started mocking them and said, "Well, they're drunk. Maybe they've been on the wine." And then Peter was saying, "It's only but the third hour of the day, and these are not drunk as you suppose." So here, verse fourteen, and I'll start reading. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, "Ye men of Judea and all that ye dwell in Jerusalem." Be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing, but it's the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
It shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Let me stop right there. What Peter is saying, he's saying the prophet Joel spoke it out hundreds of years ago. He said hundreds of years ago, this is what's taking place right now. Because technically the last days started when Christ went to the cross. When he went to the cross, he said, what did he say? It is finished. He finished and, and completed what he came to complete. Now, when he went to the cross, he ascended to the Father. The last days, the clock started ticking towards the last days. That's why he said in the last days... Saith, the, saith God, I will pour out my spirit. And Peter is saying, this is what Joel prophesied. Okay? I was in verse, no, verse 19. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And it, look at verse 20. We're experiencing this. We're going to experience this in September. We've already experienced three of them. The sun shall be turned darkness and the moon to what? Before the great and noble day. Of the Lord, you know, this year not only in the spring did we have a blood moon, but we had a solar eclipse in between this blood, the blood moon in uh, April and the one in September. So it's exactly what's being said; it's still being carried out. He said, as the last days started and it's clicking down, all these things are going to take place. We had a, we had last year we had two blood moons. This year we've got two blood moons plus a solar eclipse where the moon will turn to blood and the sun will be darkened. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that awesome? Whosoever. It didn't say him, her, or maybe. It says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 22, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also no. What he's saying, you men of Israel, you all saw the one that you crucified. He said, basically, you're the one that crucified him. He said, we walked with him. We're his disciples. We walked with him. We talked with him. We saw his miracles. We saw his signs. We saw everything he done. That's why they had the zeal. That's why they had the passion. Because he told them beforehand, as he, they were walking with him, what was going to take place. He said, in three days, they're going to destroy this temple. But he said, it's going to be raised again. And he's talking about his body. Of course, they were, they were a little cloudy and confused about it. They were thinking about the, 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 the structure temple. And they said, how's it going to be raised? Because it took 40 years to build. They were thinking naturally. Jesus was speaking spiritually. Okay. When he was arrested, when Jesus was arrested, his disciples were with him. When they were taking him away, the scripture says, they all forsook him. Even Peter just followed from a distance, but there was no one around him. There was no one close to him at that particular time. And what he's saying is, after the resurrection, after he did and completed, and after he said what he would do, and we saw him after the resurrection, I'm willing to go and die for him. And every one of them, but John did. John the Revelator. Every one of them were martyrs, but John. John died the natural death. There was a reason for that. I'll just tell you the reason for that is, remember John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one that wrote Revelations? Remember when Jesus was on the cross and he said he saw his mother there? He looked at that disciple and said, Behold your mother. He said, you t basically he said, You take care of my mother while I'm gone. Jesus put the charge of taking care of his mother in John's hands. And I believe that's why. I believe. The Bible doesn't say that. Even history will tell you they put John in a pot of oil in the oil wooden bowl. Finally, they, and, and there's, there's records that they were trying to kill him, but they couldn't kill him, so they said, we'll just exile him out on this island somewhere. And God said, that's exactly where I want him, so he can write the book of Revelations. So if I can get him away from everything, get, get his mind cleared of all, all these other things, he says, I'll put him out there and I'll give him a vision. And he'll see me in the spirit realm. Because when the book of Revelations, we call it that, but you know what, if you continue reading, you know what it says? It says, the book of Revelations of Jesus Christ. 
He said, I'm going to let John write about me. <laughs> we called the book of Revelation, but he said, I'm going to let John write about me. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosened the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. <clears throat> Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, he would rise, raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. <clears throat> Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David <clears throat> is not ascended unto heavens, but he that himself the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make my foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let me skip down, just because of time. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in, in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to men, as every man hath need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Wow. That's the message of the first church. That's the message of the church of God that's on fire. That's the message. And if you keep reading, about 3,000 souls get saved, get brought into the kingdom. Just by Peter standing up and preaching, Jesus Christ crucified, resurrected on the right hand of the Father. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> they said, we walked with him. We talked with him. We saw these signs. We, we saw these wonders. Remember Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas. He ain't doubting no more. I can tell you that. We call him Thomas. He's called Thomas or Didymus, I guess. But uh, he was kind of off to himself when, when Jesus was resurrected. And they got to telling him that, hey, our Lord is resurrected. He said, nah, I don't know about that. He was one of those that has to see to believe, you know. So finally, the Lord loved him enough too says, I'm just going to show myself to him. And he shows himself to him. And he said, at least I feel his scars. And Jesus said, okay, here, I'm paraphrasing it. You know, you know what the Word of God says. I paraphrase it. But he said, here, feel, the, feel my hand. Feel, st just run your hand in my side and feel the scar. As soon as he touched him, as <laughs> soon as he touched him, he said, my Lord and my God. See, when Jesus touches you, you know what you say? My Lord and my God. See, it was, uh, Jesus loves us enough. He says, I'm going to show myself real to you in your life. And when you see me for who I am, then you'll say, my Lord, my God. And then all at once you'll be that member on fire. And that member will spread to another member, and the fire will spread to another member. And all at once, we have a church that's on fire for this end time work, this end time ministry. As Brother Eddie said, our ministries, because we're all ministers. Every one of us is ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are truly His. There was the breaking of bread, and there was prayer. There was breaking of bread, it refers to the communion service and fellowship. 
prayer that was done corporately in the services. If we forsake the assembly of ourselves, it does hinder the church. If we forsake ourselves of, of assembly, it does hinder the church. When members are not or are present or members are absent, it affects us all. Because if, if somebody's missing, part of the body's missing. Not only did they break bread in the assembly, but in verse 46 it states they did so in, in an informal manner, and in, in, in they did it in their homes. They didn't have to be in the church to do it. They didn't have to be in a church setting to do it. They did it wherever they went. They spread the gospel wherever they went. They spread the name of Jesus wherever they went. A church on fire is an evangelizing church. The church on fire doesn't stay within the walls. The church on fire goes outside the walls and evangelizes for Jesus Christ. Verse 47 reveals that they, that they were a people who took their faith seriously enough to share it with others. And they were praying, they were praising God and having faith. Look, look what uh, verse 47 says. Praising God and having favor with all people. Well, you praise God, you, you, want, you want people to notice you? Praise God. You praise Him. And, and God will give you favor. And when that favor comes, that's when the door opens for you to witness and be the light. Share your, share your testimony with them. The mark of a, fear, a spirit-filled believer is that there will be gladness and singleness of heart. If you'll notice down there, Verse 46, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I did a little word study on that because I want to see what gladness and singleness of heart meant. And it's in, in, in the Greek, it means gladness means extreme joy and singleness means simplicity. They, they witnessed with joy and they made it simple. Jesus Christ. Crucified, resurrected, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that uh, uh, of heart, that word heart means it's this physical and, and, and spiritual life of a person is the innermost being. Close with this. Church, God help us to be such a church in this community that we minister to people and then we'll be able to touch lives because we have to be, and I believe we are here, a church that is on fire. A church on fire is united in prayer, and I believe the church on fire, it's called the house of prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen.